The first question was, um, have you come across many occasions where you felt that you've had to argue your view of the importance of Maturanga Māori working alongside Western science, both yeah. at Manaki Whenua and in your personal life? And if oh. so, how did you manage to get your point across? Yeah, I reckon it happens all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it's really draining, actually, when you have to justify yourself, and especially in the system that's not set up for it. It's getting better, but you still have to... Well, it's just tiring justifying it all the time. So you like, feel a bit, a bit like that Greek guy, Sisyphus, pushing the rock up the hill and then it rolls back down again and you have to start again? Is it something like that? Um, well, you just keep on going. You keep barreling through. That's what yeah, you yeah. have to do. You, you yeah. can't stop just because cause it's just like when we were in school and we were young and the teachers, I mean, not these teachers here, obviously, but our, some of our teachers would tell us we were dumb and no good for nothing. Mm-hmm. So a lot of a lot of us, um, a lot of Māori get that. And it's still the same when you're doing your research in that Mātauranga Māori area that you'll have people in, in power, or I call it pseudo-power, because it's not really power, you know, um, but who are senior um, telling you that you probably shouldn't do that, you should go and do some real science. And, yeah, and then you're just, and then you're, like, kind of stunned for a bit. You're like, mm. yeah. Oh, this is my kind of senior person telling me this. What should I do? I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep on going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then later on they go, oh, actually, that was a really cool idea. And they kind of forget that actually before they had told you that it was not a good idea, you know. But if does you're it not, get, yeah, does yeah. it get to the stage where they then think it's their, or they, they put it across as being their idea in the end anyway? Possibly. <laughs> yeah. But I reckon I reckon it would be different for Katarina Katarina Ka, yeah Katarina um, Katarina um, because because she's not Maori mm. so I reckon the interaction would probably even though she might have to justify I reckon it will be slightly different because she's you know if Pakia is telling her asking her you know to justify the Maori but then she's a Pakia so it's a different engagement interaction yeah i yes. think it's more it's a more complicated interaction than you would think of just two people talking yeah there's all sorts of things it can be power dynamics it can be ethnicity dynamics age dynamics um sex dynamics whether it's male or female and so there's a whole lot of levels of yeah things that would affect your the way that that person might try and dominate the conversation or yeah i, I think you guys know what i'm talking about but yeah mm. any more thoughts arising from the um interview that i did with katarina before we move on don't forget to unmute your microphone if you're talking and keep them muted if you're not <laughs> no well, Pauline, are you ready to um, go for it as far as yep. your wee presentation is concerned? And then we can come back to questions at the end. Okay. So I'm, I'm really pleased that Paul, it, Pauline is with us. Um, Pauline, do you want, I've, I've written about you on the um, Facebook page, so I don't think I need to go through your esteemed background, but we just look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Thank you. Can you guys oops, see the, can you guys see my talk? I can. I guess people will be able to. They could send you um, a, a, a chat just with a thumbs up or something. Oh, there's a thumbs up. No, there's okay, a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah I right. can see it. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to shut up now. Okay. Uh, well, kia ora koutou, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ko Pauline Hau, um, ko maumakai te maunga, ko kōpua whara te awakotaa ki te mutu waka, ko ngā te kanganu, rungo mai wahine, um, ngā te pahauera, rākau pāko hoki, uh, ngā iwi, um, tēnei te mihi nui ki a koutou. Kia ora, kia ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, kia ora. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Pauline. I'm a physicist by training, so 
Um, a long time ago, I decided I was really into science fiction and therefore got really interested in um, physics and mathematics and stuff and was really passionate about it. And so um, I just decided to go and do that at Victoria. And then um, I went overseas and then kind of remembered that I was actually really into space and astronomy. So I ended up going to Canterbury and I ended up going down there and doing my master's in cosmology um, around dark matter and then stayed on to do some neutrino, it's astroparticle physics -y type stuff. And so looking at neutrinos coming from these things called gamma ray bursts. But actually during that time, um, I got asked to give a talk on Māori astronomy. And I was like, oh, I don't really know anything about that. Uh, okay, I'll give a talk. And it was at Te Papa, which was a bit of a crack out because that's kind of a bit of a hard out talk to give when you don't really know what you're talking about. So, uh, and this was back in 2001. And so that was um, John Hanshaw asked me to give that talk. And that's where it all began, um, my interest in Māori astronomy. So I've always really been fascinated with the stars, but then I was like, oh, what's this stuff, Māori astronomy? And about the same time, there was kind of this resurgence and um, development around uh, the, the celebration of Matariki. And so that's kind of where um, that kind of helped. I don't know, there was just a time, the time was right to kind of look at this this uh, body of knowledge called Māori astronomy, Tātai Arorangi, is what, that's what we call it. And um, yeah, and, and it just grew and grew. So um, over the years, so I'm going to talk to you about what Māori astronomical knowledge is and how we kind of developed it. Um, I'll just spend about 20 minutes talking about it. And then I'll talk to you about um, just this calendrical, calendrical system that we use. So we call it the Maramataka, which is our moon calendars. Um, yeah, so I'll talk to you about uh, who our group is and what is Māori astronomy and what are calendars and actually how we engage. If I've got time, I'll talk to you about engaging with communities, which I think is important because you guys are teachers. And, uh, and we go and engage with the communities. Yeah. So um, when I got asked to do this talk on Māori astronomy, uh, the background of my interaction with Mātauranga Māori was that I'm in my 40s, so when we were growing up, we learned one to 10 in Te Reo and Omarapati at primary school, and that's it. And, um, and you know, we grow up with, you know, significant identity issues because we're not taught. We weren't taught who we were. Our, our history wasn't important. Our knowledge wasn't important. Our language wasn't important. So all these things, you know, that kind of impact uh, who you are as a person and your knowledge of who you are, especially on the land that we stand, you know, we don't know that history. And so um, that was a real big push for me when I was doing my PhD. I realised I had, you know, I'd say half, I don't want to say half of my knowledge missing. Um, so I knew heaps about physics and heaps about space from a Western perspective and I knew nothing about Māori astronomy. Yeah, and so that's where... I, um, yeah, that's how it started. And then um, later on, we, um, I ran into this, uh, some members of this group uh, called the Smart Trust. And that, back then it was called the Society for Māori Astronomy Research and Tourism. And this group was a much smaller, much different from what it is now. And um, all the people in it were interested in Māori astronomical knowledge. And I think that must have been in around about 2008. So at the same time, there is a few of us that were getting really, um, really interested in um, Māori astronomical knowledge and its revitalisation. So a few years on, hang on a minute, can you see that? Yeah, a few years on, um, we ended up reforming this group called SMART. Um, we just had a bit of change. So before it used to have quite a few Pākehās in there. But um, we decided that for such an important revitalization of this particular knowledge, everybody had to be Māori on the board. Because um, some of its knowledge is very sacred and very, very important. So this was the most appropriate group of people to get. Um, yeah. Is everyone still with me? It's very silent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And then, uh, so we had people from the community of Waka. So I don't know if we can, can you guys see that movie maybe? So we have people from the Waka community. So Jack Thatch is a Po navigator, he's a celestial navigator. And then we have Hotudu Akur, he's a tohunga around um, Waka and Waka voyaging. And so is um, Komato Hector Busby, very famous uh, Waka people that we have on our board. And they're all passionate about the stars. We have local iwi members as well who are passionate about education. Uh, Taku Purai from Ngāti Tōa. Um, we have people who are experts on maramataka, so a moon calendar. So we have Oki Simmons. Um, so people from all different, um, all different iwi. We have Master Carver. Um, and uh, he's also a doctor around education and Māori knowledge. This is one of our most knowledgeable experts on Māori astronomical knowledge, which is, he's now Professor um, Oyumata Mua. And then we have um, uh, another educationalist, Tor Waka from Ngāti Tor as well. So um, just a bit about the Smart Trust. So the Smart Trust is... Um, aims and objectives are to preserve and revitalise our astronomical knowledge and, um, and also to encourage pathways. So we do a lot of education outreach programmes to encourage our kids into science and mātauranga Māori pathways. So, or a combination of both, whatever that looks like. Yeah, um, yeah so that's me uh, working with Cornflower actually with the kids in Tuhui. And that's us in this picture here is us in the planetarium dome. And so um, the revitalization of those two bodies knowledge is part of the overall revitalization of our knowledge as a whole. So arts and crafts have been revitalized, our medicine has been revitalized, kapahaga is huge. Um, yeah, and language of course is there's huge transformations with the language, and you guys would have seen this in some of the secondary schools where they're starting to make it compulsory. In my daughter's school, they're making it compulsory for year nines. So really transformative space. And of course, our Māori astronomy and our moon calendars, that's, um, that's where we're at. So I actually went over this before. So in the 1990s, the late 90s, that's when they started to have that resurgence around the practice of matarihi, well, the not really the true practice of Matariki, but the realisation that Matariki actually existed and they people started doing some sort of celebration around it. Um, and there, from there, there was a real hunger about communities wanting to know and there is still such a huge hunger out there for um, people who want to know about Māori astronomical knowledge. And so I started a little project around about that same time that I met the original members of SMART. Um, I just started doing a postdoc on it and um, looking at that kind of interface. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a three-year project. And it ended up, my friend goes, oh, I think it's a bit more than three years. And now I think we're at year, I don't know, eight, nine or ten. <laughs> so, yeah, he just laughed and said it's about 20 plus years. So, yeah, now we've got really big collaborations. So we've got two Marsden projects. As some of you might not know Marsden. Marsden, those really big kind of grants you can get to do research. And so we've got one called Timori Fritoi, and we've got one called Ngataka Huringa Oteao, which is uh, two really big projects around revitalising the practices and beliefs and knowledge around Māori astronomy. And the other one was looking at the effects of climate change on traditional calendars. Um, just a bit of a historical background, I'll just go through this real quick because most of you will know this. But... Um, when we talk about knowledge loss, you know, how did our knowledge get lost? Okay, so if you look right back to when we had our first encounters with, uh, with Europeans, we had um, an estimated population of a few hundred thousand, but when the diseases arrived, population was decimated. And with disease, you usually find that it's the older ones and the younger ones that get killed off. So a lot of those older ones, um, the ones that are tohunga or experts that you would expect who are older, would um, be more susceptible and more susceptible to dying off. Um, also, there was the Talking the Suppression Act, although people do kind of debate on how much this actually affected. I only know it from my whānau's um, uh, perspective. My great-grandmother um, pretty much stopped practising her um, traditional practices around healing and that and kind of kept it pretty on the lowdown um, because of the Suppression Act. 
Yeah. And that's not that long ago, so my great my grandmother couldn't speak English. Um, I think she only said one word, which was Coco, uh, just because of some ads they would hear. But yeah, so it wasn't that long ago when, you know, people couldn't, um, some people couldn't speak English. But also were affected by this talking the suppression act. And that leads to a reduction in numbers of experts and on traditional knowledge. Um, also, oh, that's just a copy of the Talking the Suppression Act. So if you practice any sort of quackery, you could be imprisoned or fined. That's what that was about. So quackery, it was mostly aimed at people who um, were, were doing such um, healing practices and things around having supernatural powers of, and treat, for treatment and cure of diseases. Yeah. Um, and this is just an example, actually, of someone who got fined um, for, actually someone from where I'm from, got fined for um, practicing. Um, also, uh, the early Native Schools Act as well. So the early schools were taught in Te Reo, uh, Te Reo Māori, um, and that was the missionary schools, but then after the land wars, that's when the Native Schools Act came in and they set up their government, or well, I suppose state schools, and aim really was for assimilation. Now my my mother and uh, my uncles and that would get the strap. My, my mum was a bit of a goody good, so she never got the strap. But um, our whanau and that would get the strap if they spoke te reo Māori in class. And if you don't have te reo Māori, it's really difficult to understand your knowledge. Yeah, not saying it's impossible, but it's a real hindrance. So your language is your vehicle of knowledge, right? Yeah, and then this is all perpetuated in our education system, as you know. Um, and as Katerainas was talking about that, you know, this our education system is all based on European models and European knowledge. Even like I know in, I'm at university, uh, so many people were from Europe in our departments and not, not the one I'm in, I'm in a cool one. But my old department, everybody was from overseas and then they would go over and get their students from overseas and they were, everything was, and then they would bring people from overseas because it's perceived as better. And like, we just don't even have a look in, yeah? And so that's a real problem. And it's a real problem around, um, you know, having an acceptance of having Mātauranga Māori in the system as well. Because, you know, they might say it at the top level that they want it included, but really on the ground, do they really want it included? I don't think so. So yeah, so that's, that's a real problem. Um, and especially when they perpetuate um, dominance over what the content is, then, yeah, that's very problematic. Okay, so uh, Māori astronomical knowledge, um, what is it? Um, well, it's actually broader than what you would perceive as astronomy um, in a Western context. So our astronomical knowledge is cosmology to agriculture, it includes fishing, it includes prophesizing, and it includes this thing called our maramataka, which is calendrical systems. Um, so just a bit on our cosmology, you know, our very fundamentals of where we originate from, from something called te kore, or the potential or nothingness, through to rangi and papa, which most of you would know about, to the various gods that we, um, that were produced by rangi and papa, to how the sun, moon and stars were created. And this, this, is, this is actually really interesting whakapapa here, where we have, um, this is one version of where uh, the stars were actually formed. So we have Te Rā, uh, Te Marama Ngawhitu and Hingatore, that's phosphorescent light, yeah? We're born from Tango Tango and Wainui, but over here, and, and they came from Rangi and Papa, but over here they also had Tāne and Hine Ahuone, and who actually produced humankind. So there's an actual relationship a whakapapa relationship with the sun, moon and stars through this relationship here and our common ancestry of rangi and papa. So um, as Katirana was talking about that holistic view, we have a holistic view also with the sun, moon and stars because we all have the same genealogy. Um, uh, like most cultures around the world, we have different kōrero about who the stars were. So this is one example of the Milky Way, which is called Te Mangaroa, and there's lots of different names. Te Mangaroa means uh, a manga or mango, 
is a um, is a shark, so it's a long shark in the sky. Uh, Tamanui Tera is a male, and he's got two wives, Hene Takurua and Hene Raumati, who are, two, who are stars. Um, yeah, and Marama. And so there's famous stories that you guys would have heard with Rona and the moon. Um, yeah, and so that's Marama, the moon. And then we have things like the Southern Cross. So um, every culture around the world had different perception about who the stars were. Um, for us, we have one called Atutahi, which is a great chief in the sky. And he was the chief that, that they told him he was the chief to reign over all the stars. And yeah, to be the great rangatira. Um, there's also waka in the sky. So this is actually an anchor um, called te punga. So this is an anchor. And then you have the pointers is the rope. And then it heads over to um, the tail of Scorpio. That is, um, um, actually there's a couple of waka in that one. But one of them is Te Waka Tamaririti. Yeah. And that was actually a main vehicle for putting the stars up into the sky. Um, Puanga is a really important star, Rigel, which um, uh, Rigel is uh, Puanga. And puanga means to blossom. So in um, our old literature, um, or our old, what do you call it, our old manuscripts, they'll describe the different types of puanga that were created in the universe. And the, one of them was the puanga of the sky. And that's the blooming of the sky or blossoming. Um, and puanga is actually used instead of matarihi in a few different iwi, actually quite a lot of different regions around Aotearoa to indicate the new year. Um, here's just an example of some of the um, different stars. You've got, well, actually this planet's moved differently, so that's Matafero and Pariaro. Oh, that's supposed to be Jupiter, actually. Pariaro, Taumatakuku, um, Totoru, so it's Orion's Bout, so just different names. But my colleague's got about a thousand different names, and actually he is a real expert in, in the stars. Um, another main thing is Maramataka. So Maramataka refers to our calendrical system. Um, so you know how we have our kind of Gregorian calendar now, where we've got our 28 to 31 days, and um, we have these things called blue moons. Yeah, where you have two full moons in a month. But really, that whole calendar is just a mishmash and like kind of rejigged to be able to fit the solar year. So, and it was originally based on the moon cycles, but is totally kind of out of kilter with all that. And um, yeah, so our traditional maramataka was based on the phases of the moon, which could be around about 28, 29 of them. And um, each of those would have a name, I'll show you in a minute. And also the position, mostly of the stars, where the stars rose would tell you what time of the year it was, as well as under other indicators in the environment. Um, so the stars are really important for indicating what time of the year. So we have Matariki, there's Matariki here rising in the morning, which is a heliacal rising. Now, when we're traveling around the sun, sometimes the stars will actually be sitting behind the sun um, during the day. So that's why at night time, we can't see it because it sets with the sun. Um, What's well, our line of sight, that means it sets with the sun. So we can't see them. Um, and so there's other stars like Vega, Farnui, that comes up in around about March, or Altair, which is Potu Terangi, comes up around about March. And those are all signs of certain seasons or certain months or certain times to be able to do something. Yeah. So far away, it's the harvesting or vega is the harvesting of um, the kumara. So yeah, different tohu in the sky. Um, and then of course we have matariki as well, which I won't go into too much. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, when we teach in schools, you know, for a long time people were teaching that, you know, we had four seasons, Raumati, Ngahuru, Takuru, and Kuanga. Well, we actually had way more divisions of winter and summer. So I think there's about six divisions of summer and six divisions of winter. And so these are really um, kind of more modernised concepts of, um, of a season because that's not really how we had it. 
Um, I'll just speak for another five minutes, Michael. That's okay. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, so this is the moon cycle. So the moon cycle was, it's pretty amazing. So, um, and I think they have something called biodynamics now. Oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it has to do, you know, there's a whole kind of scientific kind of movement to around planting by the moon. But actually traditionally, lots of people treat, lots of people around the world planted by the moon and did things by the moon or had ceremonies or they had, you know, it was their clock, yeah? So you can have a stellar clock and you can have a lunar clock and actually it's all just part of your time system that you're kind of just immersed in. Yeah, and so for our maramataka, they're all really different around the country. Well, in essence they're the same, but they vary depending on whether or not you live in the bush or whether or not you live uh, by the sea. Yeah, so here's an example. So it will tell you when it's a good day to fish, when it's a bad day to um, a oh, good day to fish or a good day to plant, but actually there's way more behind it. Is it a good time to go and uh, be active or should you just stay at home and go to sleep? You know, don't, but, oh, you know, some, you know, some nights when people were driving really badly, you know, you should see, you should see what phase it is and, you know, take a record, you know, maybe they should, everybody should just stay at home. So there's behavioral things that occur with uh, the different phases. So here's an example, Uenuku, so good day for planting from dawn to midday, good night for eels, good night eeling. Tamati or Hotu, bad day for planting and fishing when the sea is disturbed by ocean currents. But this is like really kind of surface, you know, information. There's like this real in-depth knowledge behind it. Um, and just in terms of um, people who were real kind of experts in this area, uh, unfortunately, Kamatua uh, Bill Tafai, he passed away, but his wife published, finished his um, book for him. Um, cause so Bill was doing his um, thesis around Maramataka, and so this is a really good resource as well, Living by the Moon. Um, and he did a lot of work with Professor Mike Walker and James Cheeseman. So Mike Walker uh, is a biologist at Auckland Uni. He's just retired, actually. Um, but yeah, real interest and uh, really good knowledge around the moon calendar. Um, and then we've got other collaborations. So we've got people from... Um, we were collaborating with Mike Walker and also with other members in SMART as well as someone called Uriata Makiha, one of our SMART kaumatua. And what we were doing in this project was investigating the underlying reasoning behind the names in the Maramataka, or sorry, the underlying reasoning behind the observations or the, you know, those little statements that said bad day for this, good day for that, and having a look at the different animals and their behaviours. So that was one of our first projects. Then UNESCO got really interested, and UNESCO um, asked us in 2013, they said, oh, can your calendar system tell us um, anything about climate change and, you know, to help inform our policy? And at that time, I was like, I have no idea. Yeah, but actually, years later, we formed this big project around, which I'll show you in a minute, based on these conversations we had back in 2013. And we also had a wānanga after that and brought in people who were interested in the maramataka and had a really good mix of some scientists and then community and people from overseas. This is uh, Kalaina Uhiwa, an expert on the maramataka, a moon calendar from Hawaii. Uh, she's actually on the big island at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we've got a couple of other projects. So I'm just finishing up, Michael. Um, this is called Timodia Fitty Toy, and this project is around collating knowledge around uh, practices of Māori astronomical knowledge, uh, beliefs, and looking at uh, traditional kind of observation sites. Yep, and having a look at that. And our PI, our principal investigator, is Rangi Mātamo. So he's him. He's one of the most knowledgeable people in um, in um, Māori astro astronomical knowledge. Um, and this is our other project. So this is, so, you know, as we developed our projects, then we're like, oh, we should do a maramataka one. Oh, let's, oh, remember what UNESCO said? UNESCO says, oh, can our calendars tell us anything about climate change? Oh, let's, let's think about that a bit more. Anyway, we put it together and thought about it for quite a few years and formed this project. And now we've got um, 
the project before this and this project are all Mars, they're both Marsden projects. So they're really well supported. And I've never really, you know, we didn't want to put into the science fund of the Marsden because we weren't too sure if they would go for something that was Māori and just be straight up. I was not sure. I don't know if I, I would, uh, but we put this into another category because we knew that they would be more open to Māori research. Yeah, it's kind of sad, right? You'd hope that the science would be interested in our project, but I don't know if they are, because this is real mātauranga Māori. Um, and this project is around, you know, looking at our what's happening in the forest, and the ocean, and the sea, um, the air, the clouds, uh, what you feel, um, I mean, animal behaviour, and asking people in our communities, have you guys seen any changes? What do you, how do you measure what time of the year it is? Have you seen shifts? So that's kind of, um, you know, oh, and could it be because of climate change? That's our big question. Or is it because of pollution and human encroachment? So, yeah. Uh, I'll just skip that and I'll just show you one last thing, which is our community engagement. And this is our community engagement. So there's no point doing your research if you don't go and tell your people. Yeah. And so we want to go and tell the whanau what we're doing and we want to inspire the kids so we have these outreach programs before we did it with no money which was always interesting <laughs> but we'd still get around lots of places and this is in Waitahuna at the Kurukaupapa Māori um, so we just took, I took a whole lot of physics stuff then later on I got donated or Smart got donated this dome planetarium dome and trained us up and we bought some upgraded it and then we made up, oh, we went for those uh, Curious Minds funds and we ran these massive programs that had about four and a half thousand, or oh, three and a half thousand, sorry, Māori and Pacific Island kids come along and learn about Mātauranga Māori, Mātauranga Pacifica and science. Yeah, and so that's kind of our last things that we were doing and they've been really big and now our last thing was having a look, um, uh, delivering our planetarium program, which is all around Māori astronomy, navigation and waka, all in Te Reo Māori, Te Kurakaupapa and other schools around the country. So that got to about 2,500 kids. And this is still ongoing. We're just trying to find some funders at the moment. But yeah, and that's kind of like what it's like inside the dome. It's really exciting. They get very excited about it. Anyway, thank you. Yes, Thank you very much. That's great. I've got a really quick question to start off with. When you say you go and uh, share up and down the country, does that include the South Island? Oh, yeah. I usually go to Akaroa, actually. Oh, good place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and my <laughs> colleagues go to Bluff and in Bukaro, oh, but more Bluff. Yeah. Te, uh, and Tikapu. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, that's more to have discussions, I think, is in Tikapu. Yeah, then, yeah. So you, you consider visiting a school in Christchurch as well, would you? Yeah, I, I've always done a lot of, out, my, when I was living there, I did a lot of outreach in Christchurch. It's actually, I in Dunedin, we went to Dunedin. It's just actually transporting the gear, it's the hard bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. anyway, let's, uh, thank you very much for that. That was, that was brilliant, I really loved it. Um, let's, uh, throw, let's throw it open to people to ask questions and um, discuss. Mm-hmm. Hi, like Pauline. Hi, Pauline. It's me, Nikki. Sure how are you? Good, thank you. Hello. Um, just wanting to know how the um, Matariki, it's got a special association with the Māori, Kumara and um, Kurukuru, uh, Koukou. Could you tell me why and how that, what that special um, connection is? Yeah, so um, this is according to Tuhoi, so you can you can find this online as well because my colleague Rangi released the information. So you know how for a long time they were talking about Matariki being the Seven Sisters, but that's actually an introduced concept. But for Matariki, um, the different stars represent different kind of realms. So you have Waiti and Waita. Waita means salt, and so the Wai is water, so you've got the kai that you find in the salt water, so the sea. Oh, okay. Um, Waiti is the fresh water. Um, yep. Tupua Nuku, Tupua Rangi. So Tupua Nuku talks about the kai in the ground. 
So that's your kumara and yep. your potatoes and, well, you can say pumpkin now, I suppose, and, yep. you know, carrots, you know, all those kind of newer ones. But, yeah, so that's associated with a little kai around that. And to put on use like the kai and the, on the tops of the very tops of the trees, like the berries and the birds and stuff. And then the other stars, because there's nine stars, they're associated with other things. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So um, with Matariki, um, we teach our children um, at school that there is another name like tiny eyes or small eyes. Is, that, um, is, is there a, um, some knowledge behind that? Um, there's a call um, like mata. The mata is like, I think it's the white bit in your eyes. Okay. You know, and a ariki is like a chief, right? Yes. And so there's a call at all that... Um, when Rangi and Papa were separated, um, Tafari Matia was really closely connected to Rangi. And so when they were, his parents were separated, he was really upset and angry. And so um, this quarter all comes from Tuhoi as well. But what he did is he actually pulled out his eyes and he crushed them in his hands. And then he um, threw them into the sky. And so according to my colleague, Dangi, so this is from him as well, um, that's why the wind is unpredictable sometimes and kind of darts around in different okay. directions because yep. Tafari Mati is blind yep. and he is trying to fulfill his way around. Okay. Yeah. But on um, Wakahuya, I think it's Wakahuya, um, there's a, a whole show um, that Rangi does around Matariki and the stars, mm -hmm. which has a lot of this corridor on there. Okay. Cool. Hmm. Which could be you could be good good place to start with information. Start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've got a publication as well that can get emailed around. Oh, great! Thanks. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Pauline, I've got another question. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm very Pakeha, right? If I were back in the classroom. What advice would you give me about how to pay due respect or to involve Matariki Māori in my teaching and my students' learning? Uh, yep. I guess I was thinking about this before. I think you should involve the whānau as a whole, like the Māori parents. Mm -hmm. And um, like usually they have hui, like they have whānau hui. Right. Um, and engage with them and ask them, Mm -hmm. what they would like. You know, I could tell you what I would like the kids to learn, but actually what do they want their children to learn? Yeah. Right. So and what, and if they said, what if they said, well, I, I don't want my kids to learn any science? I would be quite sceptical that that would happen. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you didn't have whānau hui in that, I, I think just generating that conversation with them about what, you know, what would they want to learn. And because there's local iwi knowledge too as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. But you can um, look up resources and, you know, think of different fun ways or see if there's local komatsu that might want to come in. I know sometimes they're a bit over, you know, not over overdoing stuff, but, you know, um, They've got, they're too busy, but then right. there'll be other people who might want to come in and, and help. But I reckon it's also about the school resourcing people to develop resources as well. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. there's, there's, they don't put a value. If you don't put a value on it and don't bring in the capacity, how are you supposed to develop stuff yourself if you don't know? Or you can try, but it's hard. Even the Māori teachers you know, in the primary schools, I've seen them, they're struggling because they've got so much to do. They have to translate everything. They have to do everything themselves. And, you know, it's just it's such a big job. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. But there's already resources out there. But, yeah, I think it's really important to actually have a whānau hui first. I think it's a good idea. Mm. The what, 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 what is, inter well, what concerns me, interests and I find really sad is that wherever you look, where there has been, you know, where, where the, um, 
the British have been, they have stuffed up um, indigenous cultures. I was sort of thinking about um, the First Nation people in Canada and the States, and I'm thinking about even nearer home to Britain, the, the Welsh people and the way that their language, they were beaten for speaking yeah. Welsh. And yeah. I'm, I'm have, Welsh as well. They yeah. have their own traditional knowledge, the, the, the Welsh Mabinignon stories and, and so on, which have been sort of completely repressed, just beginning to come to light now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's so sad. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a real failing in the British psyche, I think. Yeah, and you know, it still happens. Not yeah. the British, um, I won't name what other groups, but because <laughs> they're too big. <laughs> but they, they continue to do it, yeah. But mm. then the worst thing is, is that even though when they know the background and the ancestors of those people know, it still perpetuates. Yeah, yeah. It's the perpetuation of the systems, and then they, I don't know, it's just really weird. Mm. Yeah, because, you know, where I stand from, and our people are, you know, we're, in a, we're on a Pacific Island. I remember going to a Pacific Island tutorial and they told me I couldn't go to it because I'm not a Pacific Islander. And I was like, um, I'm, aren't we in the Pacific? And I was really confused. It was another knockback on my identity. I was like, hang on, I'm Māori. Aren't we Pacific Islanders? Yeah, we're Pacific Islanders. So it was like really, like, really bizarre. And that was another disconnect. It was like, oh, hang on, mm. but we're from there. Yeah, and so it was at university. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got lost in my thoughts. <laughs> um, but it, it is a tragedy. It's absolute, sorry, I just finished it. It is an absolute tragedy, and my heart just cries when I see our other Indigenous cousins who are, they are way worse off than us. I know that. I mean, not justifying where we're at at all, but... Yeah, just, I mean, in Aboriginal communities, it's just atrocious. And our First Nations whanau. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're the ones they got ripped away from their families and put into those homes. You know, it's just, it's obliteration, really. A cultural, it's cultural obliteration for dominance, for resources and land. Well, genocide, and really. Yeah, and it still continues. Yeah. I smile. Who, 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 <laughs> who's got a lighter note to? <laughs> to <laughs> yeah. Can uh, you? Someone else was going to ask a question before I interrupted. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit how the Maoris um, actually first came about um, learning to use astronomy for their planting? Oh, well, that comes from the islands beforehand. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so, you know, like, we're from Rarotonga and Samoa and Tahiti. Yep. So they've got, I can't show you it, on a Tahitian map up there now, and it's got heaps of similar names of the stars on there. Mm-hmm. Um, the moon calendar, we've seen, there's, you know, everybody around the Pacific had that. Mm-hmm. So, but when you come from over there to here, you have to adjust because there's different stars, yep. um, different environments that you... You, you are in so if you're by the sea if you're in a warmer climate you're going to have different plants you're going to have different things that can grow and can't grow and then you actually have to you use it as your basis but then you have to adjust mm-hmm. uh, adjust all your planting so you know you might look up a maramataka you know to teach your kids but it probably might not be the maramataka for your area exactly yeah, but, you know, you can use it as a basis and then or ask the local area if they've got theirs or have a, have a good look okay. first. And then um, you can actually build, you can do experiments. Just build on that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, kids, we're going to find out what the best day to plant on is. You know, make mm. sure you water them. Yeah. You know, and that <laughs> whole scientific... Sure yeah. yeah, I'm not very good at looking after gun, but, <laughs> you know... Within your health and safety parameters, you can. Um, that's an awesome experiment. Experiment. There's quite a lot that they've done with the biodynamic people have done with their way of looking at planting by the stars as well. I was just thinking. I wonder whether there's, you know, how people um, track things back culturally in mm. terms of how things are tied back to 
previous civilizations. I wonder whether there's a sort of um, family tree of cosmologies that go right back to, I guess, Africa in the, in the beginning and how it diverted yeah. because in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to have a different one from the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I have thought about that before. I've and what conclusion did you I, come to? <laughs> I, my conclusion that would take a very long time to investigate. <laughs> a good postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 20 years. <laughs> yeah, because you would expect your sacred knowledge to be the one that didn't alter it as much. But then it depends, eh, who's in power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who might want to alter what for their own needs mm. or their own desires. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, because it would be interesting to, you know, throughout the Pacific, you know, we've got common um, cosmological stories and themes. Mm. Yeah, but how far back does that go across each way? Mm. It'd be kind of cool. How are we doing for questions? Any more? It's Jen here. Can you hear me? Yes, Jen. Hi, hi, Pauline. Kia ora. How are you? Kia ora. You're, a, you're um, a little bit crackly, mate. Am I? Is that better? You're all right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm interested in when you're doing your research and you have um, many stories and um, conversations with different um, iwi and hapu, how do you manage? Do you, do you look for themes? Because I would imagine you're not trying to prioritise one sort of knowledge over another. So how do you manage that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, themes is one thing, but actually you want to keep that knowledge specific. It depends if it's for a maramataka project, it, keeping it specific to that area is really important because that area will have its different indicators and different species that it would look at for different times of the year. Um, and it's actually would be quite hard to compare that with other places in terms of the mātauranga Māori, but what we would compare would be whether or not people have identified shifts or changes, and that would probably be the kind of common things that you would look for in terms of, in terms of a comparison. Yeah. Yeah, oh no, that's great, because I was just thinking, um, one of the things that struck me about what you've been saying is um, the importance of asking whānau for what is right for your community, um, you know, if it's parents, rather than thinking that there's one big answer that you, t you know what I mean? Like it, sometimes within our, within my experience as a teacher, sometimes we think that there's some absolute answers that are universal to everyone, whereas what we're talking about here is variance and difference, which is of equal importance and value. Yeah, 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 and completely important to them and very specific to their area or even their bay where they live or around the corner. Yeah, that's one thing that I really learned is when they're saying, oh, well, we've got this and this, but around the corner, it's different. <laughs> yeah. Around the other bay on the other side to the other hapu, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And even like when looking at plants, you know, it's been really interesting lately. You know, it's not just... Um, um, well, some of them will talk about, you know, when something's blooming, but actually maybe it's a specific plant that they're looking at that when that one blooms. Yeah, so it's kind of, you know, as an indicator for a certain time of year. So even that's interesting. It's like, oh, that's not necessarily maybe, a, it's not like an, a statistical average. <laughs> it's actually maybe a specific plant that they're looking at. It sounds a bit more logical, actually, when you're localised. Yeah. Thank you. That is great. Mm. So do you believe um, the Māoris, there's a, uh, I've heard this old story that the Māoris believe that um, we come from the stars. Have, do you, have you got any knowledge of that? Um, well, there are, um, there are quoted all about when we return to the stars. Yeah, or we've descended from the stars. Um, just trying to remember. Well, in terms of the whakapapa, we're related to the stars. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm more here. I, I don't want to say anything because I actually can't remember. But we, they, they do talk about it returning to the stars. Yep. Yeah. 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 But whether or not that's a metaphorical sense, I'm not too yeah. sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're supposed to go back to Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I better leave that at that because I don't want to say something. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How are we doing? Are questions drying up or are people sort of cogitating and coming up with a killer question? Well, if there's no more questions or comments, I'd like to say thank you very much, Pauline. Really appreciated this evening, and I'm looking forward to looking at the um, recording. I hope it's recorded well. Um, but thank you very much for d- devoting your evening. And uh, we'll, um, do you mind if I share this um, recording with Katerina as well? Because I'm sure she'd be interested in what you have to say. Uh, yeah, I, yes, you have my permission. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else anybody else wants to say before we um, we sign off? No, thanks very much, Pauline. It was absolutely fantastic. Namahi. Namahi nui. Kia ora. Thanks, Pauline. Oh, kia ora. Kia ora whanau. Kia te pai. Kia ora. A mātou wai māri ki te whakarungo. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting now. And um, thanks a lot, Pauline. And uh, see you around sometime. Cheers. Okay, kia ora. Namahi. Kaki de. Kia ora. Hi, Paul Marie. Namahi. Okay. Bye. Thank you.